This is The Fire These Times, and I'm your host, Joey Ayub. In this third season, we will be exploring internationalist solidarity, prefigurative politics, solar punk, and how to tackle some of the most pressing challenges of our times. Each episode will be on one or more of these topics. But before getting into today's topic, I wanted to quickly tell you that you can support this podcast for as little as two or five dollars a month on patreon.com slash fire these times. That is patreon.com slash fire these times. If you cannot donate, you can still support by sharing it with your friends and families and leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This helps it get more exposure and introduce it to more folks. That's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let's start with uh, some introductions. Uh, f- uh, Justin and Musa have already been on the podcast, but assuming folks haven't listened to the previous episode, let's let's start from scratch. Let's do it uh, alphabetically, I guess. So Fabian, Justin, I forgot my alphabet, and then Musa. Thanks, Jerry. Hi, um, my name is Fabian. I'm based in Paris at the moment. I am a human rights researcher, so I've been working for more than 10 years in the kind of human rights research field uh, in many different regions. So... I've worked for a long time with Amnesty International, but work with many different other uh, NGOs and human rights um, outfits as well. And in that time, I've worked on human rights issues in the US, so including kind of criminal justice issues, um, police killings, uh, the kind of uh, mass incarceration, solitary confinement, use of solitary confinement, um, also accountability for torture in the context of uh, the so-called war on terror, Guantanamo, etc. The majority of the human rights work and research that I've done has been connected to migrant labour abuse in the Gulf in the GCC, a lot of it focusing on Qatar, so that I interviewed hundreds of workers um, in, across the Gulf uh, about their experiences, their migration experiences, uh, exploitation, forced labour, and I've also had the opportunity to uh, observe kind of recruitment processes as well, which is a crucial part of this um, this, this, this this story, this dynamic. So uh, interviewing workers in Bangladesh, for example, before uh, they arrive or even returning from the Gulf. Um, I'm currently working more on Islamophobia in Europe. Uh, there was a recent um, kind of uh, session um, at, at PACE at the Council of Europe about Islamophobia in Europe. So I uh, prepared a submission uh, around the, the kind of rising anti-Muslim racism in Europe. Um, so I've worked across many different issues and I'm looking forward to discussing uh, the World Cup and its fallout with you. I, I think Fab hit all the, the key points and I can just go home. I don't need to be here. Um, <laughs> so I'm Justin Salhani. I'm a writer and journalist currently based in Paris, but uh, with you guys from Beirut today. I've been covering kind of the run-up to the World Cup and football in general for the last three years or more, more specifically football, but before that been a journalist based out of the Middle East uh, from Beirut um, and also reported in Jordan and Egypt and other countries regionally. Oh man. Uh, hi all, yeah, um, my name is Musa Kwonga. I'm a writer and co-host of the Stadio Football Podcast with the great Ryan Han. Uh, I'm based in Berlin from the UK originally, oh, well, born in the UK, parents from Uganda, and I write about, I write and talk about football, uh, politics, and the intersection of football and politics. All of which is very relevant to this conversation, obviously. So we wanted to have this chat, really, because uh, especially Justin and Musa and I have been on this kind of group and talking kind of reflections on, on the World Cup, and... I think I just felt that we had too much to say to keep it um, in like a private chat that I just wanted to do this special episode, which wasn't really planned, to kind of reflect on this moment because for, for many reasons, and we're obviously going to get into them, this World Cup felt mm. different, I think it's fair to say. Um, I'm not even sure if the term is worse because the previous one was in Russia, which was quite bad but just different and for for many many reasons that i guess we can uh get into uh it's not all negative although we will uh mention those as well there have mm-hmm. been some positive things happening and so i want to try as much as we can to kind of um how do you say this like catch the complexity that kind of has defined has defined this world cup and so the first question kind of just to get us starting um 
is what are some reflections really start from scratch uh, on the World Cup that you've had, both good and bad, good, bad, ugly, what have you. And we don't have to kind of do this in order. Uh, so whoever just wants to start, go for it and we can be civilized. <laughs> Football, okay, I've said this on a couple of podcasts already, but I've got to say it again, football frightens me. That's my overall reflection. It really frightens me because of the things that we forgive in our pursuit of our passion for it. Football's like an abusive lover at the moment that does whatever it likes because it's beautiful and it's good in bed and it says the right things at dinner parties, we indulge it. And that is really frightening because I've seen people co-sign hatred, bigotry, just because they're from the same part of the world as that person. Um, and, and, and because criticism of that part of the world they're both from makes them feel defensive. That is a really, and I said this before we started recording, the most frightening word, the most commonly invoked word in relation to Qatar is hypocrisy. Oh, you're hypocrites, you're hypocrites, which is no defense because what they're basically saying is, oh, because we all do it to some degree, it's fine. And we should never call it out because everyone's doing it to different degrees. And I know that's quite a downer to start on. And I know that we've seen some of the best football the World Cup's ever seen. But weirdly enough, someone said to me, oh my God, it was really bad. The World Cup was such an amazing final. It's really awful that such an amazing final was in such a setting. And I said, actually, no, it's perfect, right? Because if it was a bad final, we could have said, oh, the bad football was a metaphor for the terrible conditions. No, it wasn't actually. This is what it looks like when you put all the money you can into a tournament, you're going to get an optimal result, right? And the question is this, rather like the Hunger Games, is the spectacle worth the cost? So yeah, that's my first reflection on it, I guess. Yeah, if I can add, just add a bit to that, I guess. Um, I, I feel similarly, and I think there's this conflation of what happened on the pitch justifying what led up to it off the pitch. And I've been really disappointed with how many people and many people that I respect that have kind of marginalized the conversation around migrant labor. Um, and this is why I'm really, I'm really glad that Fab is here because... Mm. Um, you know, they've they've either used it as a post note or kind of a a, a sentence to to throw in beforehand to, to add a but and talk about something else. Mm. When for me, I think this should be the central legacy of this this tournament and should be the the central talking point. Oftentimes, I mean, of course, we can talk about other things and we want to talk about the football and people will do that. And I think you know we'll do that here as well. But. Um, you know, the the life lost that would still be alive that didn't happen with previous tournaments, I think mm. is just a way bigger talking point than a lot of people have given it time for. And it's not to say it hasn't been covered because it has been covered and it's been well covered. Um, but I also think it's been either treated as one of many talking points or something that people kind of use as like a, let me throw this in before I talk about something else. Right. Um, I share a lot of the reflections that, that Musa and, and Justin uh, raised. I've found it incredibly emotionally complex, um, if I'm being honest. And I guess the way that I've engaged with this World Cup has constantly, I felt like I've had multiple lenses like in my head um, at, at the time. And I've been conscious, uh, constantly um, kind of reflecting on which lens is getting more prominence, both you know, in, in my own reflections, but also in terms of the discourse and uh, the way that the, the reporting is happening. Um, I'll be honest, it's the, it's the second World Cup where it's the second least matches I've watched at a World Cup live, if I'm being honest. Um, and the, the, the first one was in 2006. I barely watched it in that World Cup. And that was because for purely kind of personal reasons, my father had died uh, not long before my relationship with football is very intense. It's you know it's a huge part of my character, my 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 uh, my personality and my memories and, and my relationships. And I just couldn't bring myself to watch that World Cup. It was just too emotionally raw. And so I thought a lot about about you know how much of this World Cup am I going to watch in twenty twenty two, having done you know a lot of work over the past uh, number of years. And, you know, I didn't take a stance as such. I didn't say, I'm going to boycott. I'm not going to watch. I'm going to make sure I watch all. I just kind of tried to see how it organically went. And the reality is I found it quite hard to engage with initially, largely because of the discourse around it that, that you described. And I think 
the way that a lot of the kind of core issues, the kind of real lived experience and like ongoing human rights abuses were being reduced to a kind of reactionary scarcity politics, which I found very disconcerting and uh, made it difficult to, for me to engage with. But then the reality of the sport that I love did kick in as well. You know, I ended up, I, I, I may not have been watching all the matches live, but I was listening to Stadio you know, to, to find out, <laughs> get some analysis. Uh, or I was watching highlights, uh, you know, um, when, um, when, when my, my, my young son had just gone to sleep, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't completely separate from, from it. And I didn't want to because there was part of me who was like, why should I? I love this sport. We all love this sport. None of us chose these circumstances. Uh, none of us wanted this um, this final to, this tournament to happen on uh, the basis of you know systematic labor abuse. And part of me was kind of almost reacting against that in a way, like in a maybe a kind of petulant way. So I, I don't want Infantino to rob me of this, like the sport I love. Um, so my my engagement grew and grew, um, but the complexity certainly remained. And I think there is a lot to unpack uh, about how the discourse was shaped. And I think one of the lenses that I was referring to that I think I couldn't help but um, uh, but recognize was just that so many of these arguments were actually long-standing talking points of the Qatari authorities and their partners uh, and FIFA uh, going back. You know, the, the things that I'd heard in meetings from like 2013, 2014, um, that then they were kind of almost like released into the wild, uh, into the kind of commentary uh, circus. And but then now they have more currency in a weird way. And that made it even more dangerous, I think, coming back to what Musa was saying. Like I also was quite frightened by... Um, the way that once the football starts, these very kind of reactionary, rudimentary kind of uh, justifications um, become legitimate talking points when, and, and so it's quite scary to realize or to recognize and have to confront what football can legitimize. Because it, it, one thing that's been in my mind is thinking, well, you know, what, <laughs> like if football can still be as special as this World Cup showed it, it is in these circumstances. Like, where is there anything that we will actually say, no, we, we can't associate football with this? It's terrifying. Uh, because, it's terrifying. Yeah, it's terrifying. And, you know, watching the final um, as much as, as I could watch uh, or trying to look after my, my son, he was kind of causing chaos. Uh, <laughs> um, I was just kind of observing and thinking, yeah, this is a guaranteed investment. Because football over 120 minutes will always be drama and narrative and it will always be engaging. And if you put it in, so whatever space, whatever setting, it will still deliver. And that, as Musa was saying, yeah, it's kind of scary. I started uh, with at least, the, um, I think, the intention of boycotting. I told myself, I'm just, or at least I just don't want to deal with it. I, I came very much from the perspective that. Uh, Justin and Musa and I had done this episode a few months ago, and I told myself on, on this topic, at least on the topic of ante anticipating the World Cup and what we expect from it and stuff, and the politics behind it, obviously. Um, and so I told myself, okay, like I did my part. I know that I'm going to be very frustrated at a lot of the discourse. I anticipated some of it, just for the reasons that we'll probably get into anyway, uh, and are maybe familiar to many folks listening, if not most folks listening. But at some point, I don't remember which match it is. I think that was Japan playing at some point. I think it was, was it Japan, Germany or something at some point, something like that. Um, and I, I I started watching. I watched first the highlights and then after that, I started following the matches. And then the, after the round of 16, I watched, I think, all of them, if not most of them. And the reason was I I felt like there was something happening. Again, some of the topics that we had already discussed in that previous episode. And I was very curious to sort of see uh, how they develop. Uh, I just wanted to see where this goes. Uh, and I had the sense that a lot of the nuances of what's happening will be missed for, again, the many reasons that... Um, actually, let's let's start getting into them. Mm -hmm. We saw a number of the um, tensions, let's say, the lack of nuance around 
uh, whether it's topics around the, for, let's take, for example, the example of the kafala system or the migrant workers in, in Qatar. Mm. You had folks who were focusing on the issue itself and then have kind of quote unquote alternative agendas. Mm. You had folks who clearly didn't really care about the issue, but just wanted to have some point and to make some point about Qatar or about Muslims or about Arabs or whatnot. You had Arabs and or Muslims who took it personally and actually went kind of the other way around and were defending Qatar, uh, which something that honestly not many folks would have done prior to the World Cup, which again shows the power uh, of sports washing, obviously. Mm. Um, and I'm probably forgetting some. And you had obviously folks who are also, let's say, Arabs or Qataris or from from the Gulf, or whatnot, and who just didn't care about migrant deaths and whatnot. Like the, all of those folks existed at the same time, and probably more folks as well that I'm forgetting on the spot. And the coverage, let's say, I I did hear, for example, friends of mine who, let's say, are Arab activists. Uh, saying stuff like the coverage is problematic, which to a large extent I would agree, or to some extent I would agree, depending on what coverage we're talking about, because that's a kind of a broad statement. And because of that, they were focusing on pointing out how problematic the coverage was. At the same time, and this goes back to kind of this politics of scarcity, because they were doing that, or because they were focusing on that, they didn't have much to say about the actual problems that would sometimes are highlighted in this coverage, and this coverage would then be coupled with something problematic, but the content, would, let's say, would be factual. So they would say, mm. like, this is actually what happened in Qatar, na, 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 and then they would say something stupid or racist or whatever. And decoupling those two is obviously very difficult, and I'm not saying everyone has to be able to do it, but I am saying that in the midst of all of that, what gets immediately erased are especially the migrant workers who built that stadium and who still work in Qatar. And of course, LGBT communities, not just Qataris and those from the Gulf, but frankly, at this point, basically anyone who's gay or bi or trans or whatever. And we saw at the beginning, right, there was a tension where you had some folks even saying, like, don't impose this LGBT agenda on us and, you know, dumb stuff like that. And it was in me, I felt like that discourse actually won to some extent. Like it yes. actually succeeded in... definitely. And showing like, actually, this is something that, you know, we can deal with over there. Sure, it's not very nice, but this is not something that the Qataris have to deal with. Where would you say that nuance went? Or how, how did you approach it? I, I'm going to jump in. Okay. And actually, at certain points, I might jump in just because this is, it's great to have you all on the same call. Um, well, I'll just jump in and say the scary thing about it was, everyone always says like, why are there no openly gay male footballers and this World Cup, it really reminded us of that because we had like John Barnes, the um, former Liverpool footballer, um, sometime ambassador for the Qatari Football Project, going out and being like, well, look at the things we criticize and look at our own backyard. So basically like, your hypocrites are criticizing Qatar. And then he spun that into conversations about gay people and how people were not being arrested in Qatar for being gay when they actually were. Like, so he went on, he went on British, he went on Good Morning Britain. So the Good Morning, there's, there's, a, there's so much going on there. The British media basically booking him for a prominent appearance, knowing exactly what he'd say. And then some really prominent British football influencers sharing his video. And that got tens of thousands of retweets and went super viral. And that really was the discourse done at that point, because the amount of people that co-signed it, it was frightening to see the people sharing. And this is the thing, again, I expect that from John Barnes. I expect that from a low-level influencer who I will not name, who disgusts me and whose name I will not speak on this podcast or in public, um, but they know who they are. But the scary thing was watching that influencer's video being shared with quote tweets with approval by people from, shall we say, the Global South going, this is interesting, this is interesting, this is interesting, and me going, oh my God, these are colleagues of mine or peers of mine who kind of hate me, actually. They kind of hate me. And the discourse was done at that point because those people have been reading my work for years. I've been engaging with them for years online. Um, and they hate me. They hate what I stand for. Or they hate me as a human. Or what they think I do in private. Um, and it was, when I say the discourse was done at that point, it was like watching a kind of, um, it's a digital torrent of, of, of hatred. I can't explain profoundly enough how it felt to watch thousands of people, several of whom I respected, co-sign hate for queer people in a way they would never have co-signed hate for black people 
somehow forgetting that black people are also queer, Arab people are also queer, Muslims are also queer. So yeah, just to throw that in, because that, that for me, that's where it ended. Because when you just deny that humanity at that level, it, it's done basically. Yeah, it, to me, it seems almost like Musa, that's like a Marcus Rashford moment, you know, when he missed the penalty and everyone has been waiting to just jump in on this thing. And Brilliant and point, like, yeah, excellent, yeah. You know, he built up all this this goodwill and love, but on the flip side of that, there's all these people kind of mumbling under their breath, like, mm. I'm waiting for this to happen sort of thing. Um, all the know, French I, players who missed that the, the penalties, right? I forgot their names, but uh, they yeah. also... That the also abuse is horrifying. Yeah, the abuse has been... The, it's still ongoing. The last three, four days, it's ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. Chouameni and, and uh, Kingsley Coman, I think, were the two. Mm. Um, and, um, what I mean, just to, to kind of piggyback on what Musa was saying, a lot of the, the, I guess, the discourse that we were seeing in these particular cases were people speaking out about, oh, you Westerners. And I saw a lot of frustration in, in some of my circles where people were saying, yeah, but not everyone speaking up and criticizing is a Westerner. You know, you're also kind of, by, by framing it as this sort of East-West um, kind of dialect or, or, or what's the better word I'm looking for, um, this divergence between East and West, Dichotomy, by framing it yeah, in the sort of way yeah. that's, you know, East versus West, you're actually suppressing the voices of local activists who you know, who embody these, these sort of identities, or even if not, but there are people speaking out to these things and saying, no, people within Qatari society, people within the wider GCC, Khalij society, people in the Arab world are speaking out about these things. And I think that they were just being shouted over by people who wanted to make larger points or wanted to just kind of deflect any sort of criticism or were tired of the sort of white gaze. And I understand that because it, it can be exhausting, but by doing that, we were also speaking over voices and preventing any sort of progress being made. And a huge, what could have been a, a huge platform for people from the region. And some of them did get a bit of attention and, and time, thankfully. But um, I, I just found that to be, to be really in, increasingly problematic. And um, yeah, this, this sort of, uh, this dynamic. Yeah, I'm glad you've raised the, those particular examples of those kind of peaks of discourse, which were really worrying moments. I, I agree. I think, um, with the John Barnes interventions, when I saw that, I was like, oh, there he is. Like, yeah, I was kind yeah. of waiting for it in a way uh, because he's played this role before. Mm -hmm. Ironically, he's played the role in terms of delegitimizing anti-racist movements within football. He's critiqued a lot of young um, black footballers for their way of challenging anti-racism um, in recent years. And actually, he didn't have much currency with that kind of influencer audience that you were describing also he was kind of being um he he was con considered quite disconnected mm. um from that kind of younger audience and weirdly his intervention this time round saw him almost his, his value go up in that world that people were like oh no he's a real one actually and i found that really just really really concerning the reason why uh when you know, john barnes popped up on our screens and in the times newspaper um the reason why is out there he is is because he's like you said i think it's important to point out that he has been an ambassador for this tournament he's done videos for yeah. the Qatar tourism agency uh, or uh, Qatar tourism authority in the past he um also has been willing to play that kind of political role um for the Qatari authorities before in 2017 when there was the uh, gcc diplomatic dispute you know, you saw kind of favors being called in from the political, uh, sorry, from the sporting partners that Qatar has, has built uh, with its kind of uh, sporting project. And John Barnes was one of the people who was kind of tweeting his support for Qatar in that context. Um, and, you know, you had the Barcelona team being toured around, I think it was Khalifa International Stadium, one of the, the stadiums that was built for the World Cup in 2017. They were wearing... Um, the kind of stencil image of the emir's face <laughs> during uh, uh, in, political favors have been pulled, pulled in in the past involving footballers and john barnes has been one of those people so to see him kind of rear his head at that moment was not surprising the arguments were incredibly damaging i think they were actually largely redundant i think they were really quite basic but because of who he is because he's such a visible He's been a visible victim of uh, racism in, you know, in, in his footballing career and after. He's challenged that, um, you know, and, and, you know, that image of him uh, flicking away the banana is, is, is such a, a famous image and an incredible moment in football history. Um, 
that so to have him delivering those lines i think was yeah, really damaging and disconcerting i think the other thing you mentioned the word hypocrisy and i think that's something we're going to have to talk about uh, a lot as we go forward um but i always i found one of the kind of buzzwords that i saw cropping up a lot and that i found i thought was really uh, worrying was culture mm. and uh, john barnes repeatedly referred to culture and what you had was um basically you know systematic human rights abuses both being framed as part of category or golf culture and at the same time that being used to uh, say we shouldn't critique or that you know there shouldn't be an engagement and also to deflect i think uh, quite a lot as well and i think when culture is used in that way the term culture is it's just incredibly misleading like what is you can't reduce entire people's identities to uh to this term of culture and usually i find that it is authorities or reactionary mm. forces trying to define the culture in line with the status quo that they want to maintain and they said this is our culture mm. so don't try and change it but like you said you know are, are category queer people not part of category culture of course they are there are multiple cultures cultures are also always multi um uh, always uh, are not are not singular mm. and and cultures change over time culture is a process it's not a fixed category um and i think that it was quite concerning uh, basically justifying homophobia saying that that's category culture as you said erasing uh, uh category lgbt lgbt um q people and then also you've also seen the migrant labor issue being described as in cultural terms as well which is so mm. uh just so inaccurate and so misleading because that actually erases the complicity and the partnership of many nation states in the operating of Kafala. The Can I throw this in? Not a single government, not a single Western government. There was so much talk about the West, the West. Not a single Western government opposed what Qatar was doing. It was only <laughs> members of civil society, journalists, activists, and just random members of the public. It was really emphatically not. So all this conversation about the West, the West, actually, no, not at all. The West actually approves because the Western elites approve of what's happening in Qatar. And the really insidious, dangerous, and frankly dishonest, intellectually dishonest thing I saw was people going, oh, like, this is Qatari culture. Look, like, the Qatari elite own a large part of, of London and of the UK, right? A lot of their kids will be in schools, a lot of them will be prime members clubs. They're very well acquainted with, in quote, Western culture. So this idea that, like, Qataris are not worldly and don't get out much, and we're just patronizing them because they're not global citizens. They're absolutely global citizens. Do you know what I mean? I found that really, and it was really grim how I was looking at people going, how is this the banner for your region? How are they representative of you? They're the least representative of you. That's like me going, don't attack Boris Johnson. You know, he, he he's one of us. And, 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 and because we're from the same place as him, we co-sign it. It was, it was actually that unthinking. And it was really disappointing to see people jump on that. Does that make sense yeah. with that allegiance? Yeah. I want to I wanna maybe kind of pose a question as well, because what was interesting about the kefala being described as Qatari culture, and we shouldn't touch it because it was Qatari culture, and then people brought forward that actually kefala was kind of implemented by, you know, under the, the UK, um, you know, when the UK was, was occupying Qatar or was, uh, you know, kind of in colonial control of, over Qatar, and that it was a system implemented by a British man, and then people were kind of using that to go back to the UK, which, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, is, is at least based on some truth, but it, I feel like both arguments were kind of just used to deflect from the issue at hand. And mm. so I guess the question I have here is that isn't, that was my impression was that was kind of the point. And I'm wondering if you guys would agree in a sense that it wasn't about providing um, legitimate, deep uh, answers in order to deflect criticism, but giving people who had already decided that they wanted to interact and engage and not hear about all this kind of controversy, just kind of giving them an off-ramp to be like, look, mm. if somebody comes at you, you have the culture defense. And if they come at you with this, you can say, well, actually it was implemented by the UK. And it was sort of like uh, taking away any responsibility from anyone to kind of have to sit with the complexity because in a sense, you know, like I think being a football fan is sitting with that complexity, realizing that there's a lot of dirty money in the game. The fact that the World Cup 
in the last two instances were in um, authoritarian ran countries and even before that had a number of problems re related to labor or how it um how poor vulnerable communities were affected in the run-up to tournaments and so i think what what kind of the goal here seemed to be from me at least and i'm wondering if if you you all might agree or have a different perspective is that is are these talking points not sort of the point just to distract long enough that we can kind of get on with the football you know I'll just quickly give an, a quick example to add to that, uh, and then Fabian, you can, you can go ahead. Like in Lebanon, we have something called uh, Article 534, whatever, I forgot the number it is. And that's the one that quote unquote bans, um, well, that's a fair paraphrase because I don't remember the exact uh, sentence, but like bans sexual acts against nature or whatever it is. And that was introduced during the French mandate. It was introduced during French colonialism. And some people point that out to say that, well, you know, it actually, they both people, let's say, two um, nominally opposing positions get used around the same issue. Some people say, well, clearly, then, therefore, homophobia is not natural to Lebanese society because the French introduced it. And other folks saying uh, that actually, no, it is. Uh, and that's why the, the, law, the law was passed or wh whatever it is. And what's kind of interesting is that the the common um, thing that they would have in common is that on the one hand, you will have the people who say, well, yes, it was introduced during mandate, but we need to keep it, i.e. forgetting or downplaying the fact that this is a, it's a political choice to keep that article, to keep that law, to maintain those structures in place. And the other irony is that this narrative of homophobia is a Western, sorry, homosexuality is a Western invention or whatever, like it's not native to our societies, or whatever the terms are, is actually this identical to the ultra conservative, like Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, literally says that, like mm -hmm. literally, I'm basically quoting. It's kind of ironic that this has been picked up by nominally like you know anti-colonial but not just that but like progressive voices who have nothing in common mm. with these leaders with these militiamen with these autocrats and whatnot but who are still willing to sort of discursively defend their positions if you want in some bizarre or not bizarre but like in some i think attempt to maintain some kind of purity somewhere and especially somewhere else like this doesn't affect me it's not like i'm you know i'm i don't know a, a a brown person or a migrant person living in Paris or in London or whatever. I, mm. I live in a progressive society, but those places where I come from, quote unquote, you know, they, they shouldn't be touched in that sense, like they're purer or whatever. It's a projection, I guess, is what I'm trying to say often. Mm. But yeah. Yeah, yeah they're, they're really crucial points. I think that, ha I think we just have to use the term bad faith. Like, here. like mm. what has yes, been yes, happening yes. is there had been bad faith uh, kind of invocations or calling upons of various forms of, of, of um, oppressive uh, exploitation, but being utilized in bad faith ways. And I could agree entirely with what Justin was saying to deflect, to obfuscate, to ultimately to avoid any accountability across the board. When I've been watching this discourse, I've, I've been like saying, oh, this is so mutually um, kind of co-servicing both for golf uh, autocracies, but also for um, for European and North American governments, for example, in that a lot, because when we talk about hypocrisy, there is some relevance there, but there, there are different ways around which you can talk about hypocrisy, I think, in the sense that there's hypocrisy to finger point at each other in a reactionary way to basically say, oh, uh, you're a hypocrite, so this doesn't matter. Whereas trying to build solidarities, like seeing where there are connections between different forms of oppression and building solidarities, I think is a different way. And I haven't seen conversation uh, happening that, to, to a great degree around the hypocrisy, um, the, the kind of hypocrisy discourse. Um, on the, the element of the colonial element, like, again, this is where I would just say, like, there are ways of talking about that and there are bad faith ways as well. And I think that like, it's, it's just, it's just also more complex than that in that. Yes, it's certainly true that Kafala sponsorship systems emerged um, in, in line with the kind of development of um, pearl diving and uh, especially British petroleum oil company uh, kind of administration in the Gulf. 
uh, in particular in Kuwait and Bahrain, and then spreading to the wider the wider Gulf. That's, that's a fact. And also that really what it was about was about controlling the mobility of cheap labor in the Indian Ocean um, and Gulf kind of uh, migration uh, network. But there's also an intersection with local traditions as well and customs to do with actually many people argue from a point of kind of hospitality, which is another word which has come up a lot, where the idea of a field of someone who takes responsibility for uh, an outsider, essentially. But what we, what, where we have to arrive at in terms of looking at the modern version of the Kafala system and how it evolved with the discovery of, of oil and the establishment of the autocracy uh, autocracies across the Gulf is that it's that point that Jerry made. There was, there's been a conscious decision to maintain and almost to refine to a system of perfected racial capitalism. Like mm. it, it's not there has been a conscious decision to continue that kind of control of uh, cheap labor throughout the region to refine it into the states that we we now see. And that's, I I haven't really seen that discussion. It's like I said, it's more been this kind of finger pointing to end the conversation rather than to enhance the conversation. And I think that um, that that's why I say, I think it's been kind of co-servicing in a way, both for, um, for for quote Western leads and also for um for for, for Gulf autocracies and and uh, monarchies and I think the important thing that I, I completely agree with what Justin was saying about this kind of East West dichotomy dialectic has been really um uh, just distracting it and and has taken a really reactionary lens because really who we need to be talking about is about the people within the Gulf and people from the, within South Asian civil society, migrant workers themselves, uh, trade union activists in East Africa, for example, who have been mobilizing at great risk mm. to try to, you, to, to use this World Cup to bring about systemic change. And so when we talk about, oh, it's Western hypocrisy, uh, we'll reduce it solely to that because there is, I, I do think there is some, you know, that, that has to be part of the conversation. I do think we have to look at how cynical our governments are in terms of their engagement with this tournament. But we need to do that in a way that actually sent, rather than centering um, the, the, the so called West, um, I think that we do that at the risk of, or not at the risk, at the, the outcome of delegitimizing and uh, muting the most important voices who are the, the actual people who've taken the most risk. And the thing is, the Gulf states and, and Qatar, the Qatari regime has been doing that in a very you know, heavy-handed way. If we, the case of Malcolm Badali, for example, a migrant, a Kenyan, I believe a Kenyan migrant worker who was blogging about his experiences as a migrant worker, who ended up being held in solitary confinement for more than a month. Mm. Um, you know, because they see how dangerous that is for someone who actually is a migrant worker in Qatar, who I think it's fair to say he, you know, he had a fond a fondness for Qatar as well. He talked quite a lot about the friends he made there and the the amazing experiences he had interacting with uh, with Qataris as well. But he kept he also talked about his actual experience of labour exploitation and what he observed uh, around him as well. And that was considered so dangerous to the Qatari regime that they had to literally lock him up in solitary confinement for more than right. a month and then deport him. And so when we talk about, when we reduce this discourse to Western democracy, we don't talk about the people who the country authorities actually see as a threat to their narrative. Mm. Um, and I think that that's been one of the most disappointing elements um, of how this, this these narratives have been. Have, Fabian, have I've got to out. throw this in as well. This is interesting. I've got to throw this in too. Like Malcolm was actually doing every... Westerner who is not wealthy a favor because basically the things that they've experienced, the labor exploitation, and there's obviously the more severe degree we see in Qatar, but the labor exploitation that exists in Qatar is coming to some parts of the UK. But this is the thing, this is the irony of it all. Like a lot of these autocracies have got significant property stakes in the UK, big stakes in our economy. Now the UK has left um, the EU it's especially prone to those exploitations because it's reliant on their money, it's reliant on the investment, um, post-Brexit, arms dealing, property investment. So those states are going to have even more say in Western society and primarily British society than ever before. So all those things, all those labor rights and abuses they were talking about that, that Western viewers ignored 
Does that make sense? Western view is ignored in, in Qatar. A lot of those things are coming to the UK. And the inequalities, like the winner class, you look at Qatar, Qatar basically perfected racial capitalism. You've got the elite who basically lord it over the rest, the feudal system. Britain has a feudal system emerging very quickly because of the cost of living. And that parallel was not drawn enough in this tournament. And I really worry that the kind of the acceptance of this World Cup has foreshadowed something very, very grim for Western society, if that makes sense. Yeah, just, I, I totally echo that. And I guess the reality is it's already here as well. Yes, and yes. This, yes. Is, this is what I mean about the, the bad faith thing in that I've heard um, members of the Supreme Committee who delivered, you know, who are responsible for delivering the World Cup, I've seen members of the Qatari Labour Ministry for years say, oh, but in the US you have, I think it's, the HB2 or HS2 visa um, and talk and the reality is every uh, major economy has some form of like single tied visa where a, a migrant is tied to the, their residency is tied to the employer but that has been used in a very bad way in that generally they are restricted to kind of agricultural seasonal temporary um, uh, migration systems, Australia has a similar one, uh, Canada, for example, and they are all exploitative. There's no, it's not to raise that to justify them. The yeah. point is that, as you're saying, Musa, it should be about drawing the fact that, yeah, there are actually similar forms of exploitation, but not quite to the scale. Like, that's the only visa, it's the only form of migration that exists for, for, for migrant workers in Qatar. And 90% of the population are migrants and are. Um, you know, subject to this incredibly, uh, ex you know, very excessive form of control that uh, employers have over their workers. And, but I think it, it's crucial to point out what you're saying, that these kind of single tied visas, as you said, they're increasing. Like governments across North America, um, across Europe, are trying to, uh, they're trying to follow a similar path. Like you said, that rather than it being kind of small, kind of seasonal, um, kind of exploitative uh, uh, arrangements. They're trying to make them more commonplace, more kind of mainstreamed in the same way they are in the Gulf. And you're right, there is a warning and there was a solidarity that, sh that needed to be built there that I think, like you said, wasn't uh, prominent enough um, because you're right. And, and also specifically in terms of domestic workers, I think in the UK, there was a regressive uh, piece of legislation in the kind of mid 2010s which actually basically introduced a similar restriction on domestic workers being able to uh, to to change employer, therefore yeah, significantly increasing the, the the risk of exploitation. And I think the other thing that's sometimes a bit bad faith about those arguments when they've been put forth is that what's quite specific to to Qatar and the GCC is the absence of any kind of remedy process. Um, Workers in those situations really can't extract themselves if, if they find themselves in like kind of uh, uh, isolated, in complete isolation and being subjected to forced labor. There aren't functioning um, judicial systems. There aren't uh, kind of readily available lawyers to really help them kind of uh, hold their employer accountable. And I think that's why that there has been a bad faith element of kind of citing um, uh, different uh, similar kind of single tied visa uh, labor regimes, rather than like you said, pointing out the fact that yeah, you know, it's this harbinger in a way for what um, you know increasingly restrictive uh, migration regimes are trying to be mainstreamed uh, in Europe and North America for sure. Throughout the the conversation that we we're just having now, especially in the past ten or so minutes, I started I I like one thought came came to my mind, which is Iran. Which is like Iranian players or Iranian football in general, not the individual players necessarily. I don't know them all, but the risks that uh, players have to go through, they, they they have to take, and not just again players, fans. One thing that we saw a lot, um, or those of us who are kind of looking for them, is um, let's say Iranians who are participating in the ongoing uh, uprising in Iran, or Iranians who are in the diaspora and who are trying to shine a light on what's happening. They would point things out like, well, my brother uh, was a huge fan of Messi, for example, and there's a photo of one of the Iranians I remember, photo of him uh, with you know uh, that with the you know the Messi's jersey and whatnot. Um, but he was killed by the Islamic Republic uh, like ten years ago, or something. Uh, you had Syrians actually who, uh, because you know people are talking about like Arab solidarity and whatever, like Syrians who were at the stadium in the stadiums in Doha. 
who were taking photos of themselves with a uh, phone image of a loved one who was forcibly disappeared by the, the Assad regime. And that all of this isn't to say that, oh, I'm expecting every single person who's either attend attending or watching to be aware of all of these things necessarily. My point is more that what, what these dichotomies, what these oh, East-West, uh, Muslim-West or whatever, or values, culture, all of these buzzwords at the end of the day, what they tend to do is they obfuscate a lot of those actual things happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And the irony of it all is that if, if the argument is that, well, you know, you can't talk about Qatar because uh, look at what's happening in the U.S. or whatever, well, the next World Cup will be in the U.S. and Canada mm -hmm. and Mexico. So what what is the argument there that we shouldn't criticize the U.S. government, you know, or the Canadian or the Mexican government? The problem is that when we start making that argument, it becomes very easy to be manipulated. Mm -hmm. Whereas when if we use the other position, which I think we would all agree on here, that we should just be critical and we should refuse sports washing, challenge sports washing wherever we see it. I mean, that won't be perfect either. And we may make mistakes and whatever. But at the very least, we start from like a basis, a basic principle that can be applied to any situation because supposedly we all agree that there are these basic human values that have nothing to do, at the very least, or should not be uh, whitewashed through buzzwords like culture or religion or whatever. Because by doing so, as, as I think we've all just said already, we erase those people who inhabit these complexities that we're trying so desperately, we and the people who engage in that discourse are trying to erase, essentially. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think you, I couldn't agree more. We need to have these conversations more, definitely around 2026, uh, 2026 in, in Mexico, Canada and uh, Mexico. And I think that one thing that I, I think has been missing from the more kind of recent discourse um, over the past month of the tournament is a cut. There has been a recognition of exactly what you were just describing, Joey, that we can't continue to have sports. Obviously sports wasn't, didn't, you know, wasn't invented in 2010. You know, we know about the Munich Olympics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there, there has been, I think, a concerted recognition amongst um, a lot of the, in the human rights community and, and, and beyond that, um, it, we just can't continue allowing sports to to cause harm because that's what what is kind of happening really it's that it's not only a perpetuator of harm it's also kind of uh, uniquely placed to to cover that up as well mm. and i think that you know that's why i found very frustrating people saying oh why are we just talking around about this you know, now in, in Qatar, which is just not true like in 2010 builders and woodworkers international uh, kind of partnered uh, with FIFA at the time to try to, um, I, I believe that's the case, uh, but they were basically working on the ground in South Africa to um, to try to uh, protect the labour rights of, um, of, of of traders, for example, who FIFA was cracking down on. Um, around the World Cup and the Olympics in, in Brazil, there was a mass mobilisation in Brazil, which people seem to have just forgotten about. People mobilised against the World Cup. Brazil, you know, the country which loves football more than any, potentially. There were people who mobilised because they realised what was happening in terms of how the sport was being used and, and the, 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 the waste of money. And there were campaigns specifically around racist homicides being committed by the police in, in favelas. You know, in 2018, there was not enough for sure, but there were campaigns trying to highlight the work of human rights defenders in Russia and the way that specific... World Cup laws were being passed in the lead up to 2018 to restrict freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. Um, a lot of these work, a lot of, and also let me just jump in as well. A lot of the work in 2018 wasn't being done because it was so dangerous. Hmm. Because it was so dangerous. This is a place where pride, where, where LGBT activists would think twice about holding pride rallies because of the danger it would bring to LGBT activists. This is what we were dealing with. So for people to come on social media and go, you didn't talk about X, Y, Z. I'm like, actually, here's the thing. And every now and again, I would flex a bit. I'd be like, do you know what? There was huge personal risk in doing this kind of activism. And a lot of the people you're tweeting at casually from your armchairs faced a lot of jeopardy, a lot of jeopardy. There are people on social media, people that we know who have been physically threatened for doing the kind of work that people casually on Twitter said that people weren't doing for decades it was all being done. And the main difference too, if I can add, and Justin, then we can hear from him because you haven't spoken in a while, but 
like the Qataris themselves, like the authorities themselves said that this will be a safe space. They said, like they were interviewed as well as a sports minister or something. He was quite literally asked, like, well, if two if two gay men are holding hands, well, you know, would they be in danger or whatever? And he said, no, there's no problem. You know, they they are the ones, the Qatari authorities, something that I think a lot of people either don't know or honestly don't want to know. Like they just don't want to think about it in that sense. They signed on to a number of basic principles. Like the, the, the biggest irony that I've seen, to be honest with you, is after the pride flag was basically banned and after all of those symbols were banned the there was what one of the the badges or whatever it is there was no discrimination or anti-discrimination that fifa was still upholding and so for me that that was that's kind of the um, one of the multiple multiple injuries that's kind of w- was done this time around is that two things one if the argument is that we should have been more critical of russia let's say we take that argument in good faith then surely that that what should follow is that okay well our bad we didn't do as well back then let's do better this time let's let's put it that way but the second thing is that what 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 this for example anti discrimination and those discrimination is are uh, is doing because it's it's let's me put it this way it's being drained of actual meaning mm-hmm. to the sense that it's just becoming a buzzword that to for it to actually function it has to be meaningless for 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 footballers to start saying no discrimination they first have to sign on to kind of the 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 a principle if you want that okay we 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 can say it but we have to not mean it because mm-hmm. when we start meaning it that it becomes dangerous that threatens the status quo and we can't have it anymore and that's what worries me it worries me that players are themselves signing on to this like there are the players that as we all know are themselves signing on to these contracts they are being pr ambassadors and it's it's worrying me as well because i think we would all agree that in many ways russia but especially qatar are uh, have kind of created a blueprint now one that from their perspective works now there's there's still the question that maybe some regimes uh would see the heat that the criticism and all of that towards qatar and judge it to be too much maybe and so maybe to some extent there's been some success in that regard we we won't know yet obviously but uh there is a blueprint that is now established and that will blueprint will be used not just by Qatar but honestly by even worse states and that that's the worrisome thing do you guys, do you guys want me to talk now <laughs> <laughs> go for it <laughs> if i have to um and I'm, I'm just listening and and taking in um some really your guys are making some amazing points um and i think joey yeah like the the sort of um you know fab Fab, you mentioned to me maybe a month ago or more this kind of breakdown of or or watering down of the Black Lives Matter movement into kind of very like corporate friendly, um, you know, non-racist rather than anti-racist, uh, um, I guess, slogans or just very meaningless kind of like concepts without any of the the depth or or work that anti-racism actually entails. Um, and what we're left with is is sort of what you said, Joey, is that there is no risk. Um, there is no risk taken in terms of players speaking out on anything and that every message is meaningless. For example, if FIFA banned the, the One Love rainbow armband and threatened severe restrictions over something that, that and I read this somewhere and I, and I quite agreed with it, was that something that didn't really mean anything until it was banned. Um, because it was incredibly unoffensive. And, um, you know, we can also say, you know, exactly what you said, Joey, that, that Qatar agreed to a certain level of standards that they then chose not to meet. And we saw that with, uh, you know, Grant Wall, rest in peace, when he showed up to a stadium wearing um, a rainbow flag on his shirt and then was detained until he was eventually let go. And then I guess word was spread around via FIFA. Um, and again, I think... Um, yeah, I, I I think a lot of this comes back to these sort of uh, good faith and bad faith critiques. And I I wrote early on in the during the World Cup, I wrote early on um, in one piece that it, the early days of the the World Cup were quite complex, and and we had to navigate sort of good faith critiques, and then we had to navigate bad faith critiques, and then we had to navigate good faith critiques of the bad faith critiques, and then bad faith critiques that dismissed every kind of critique as a way to dismiss everything. And I think as the tournament progressed, we got even more 
into the weeds and there were all these kind of wires fraying in every which direction because you had people who were acting in very good faith, but jumping on to maybe like distractions way more than what was what more serious issues at hand were. Not to say that these other issues were not also important, um, but it just it just all became very, very messy at some point. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, at least I'm glad that we're talking today and trying to find um, some way to to dig through all these different sort of wires and figure out, you know, what is at the crux of all of this. Um, speaking of the blueprint going forward, yeah, I mean, you mentioned that, Joey, and in 2030, we've heard about a potential unified bid that may include Saudi Arabia, um, which, you know, I, I've heard many people who have vehemently defended Qatar come out and say, oh, Saudi can't get it, as though that's the line that, that nobody wants to cross. But Saudi has the playbook now. And as I mentioned to, to you guys in, a, in our group chat the other day, I think the difference between Saudi and, and Qatar, at least in terms of how the blueprint, blueprint is, is, is being formulated, is Qatar already has kind of a media ecosystem that I don't think Saudi Arabia necessarily has, or is at least not as sophisticated as, the, as what we see in Doha is at this moment. Um, but then you also think about something like, um, you know, I think Enfantino had mentioned something of a potential UAE Israel um, World Cup in the future. And I, my brain is already melting at the discourse that will emerge from that. Oh my people gosh. Want to, will want to, will want to criticize, but defend, but, you know, and, and where will we all land here? Um, or, or maybe the inverse would happen and everyone would unite and finally speak out in a unified voice of, of a line gone too far. I'm not sure, but, um, but I absolutely agree that, you know, this tying back to Musa's first point that this is how fearful football is. And, you know, it, it's interesting to think about that. You know, we watch these sort of films about dystopian futures, at least in a sporting sense. I think we're already there. Yes. But you know, I I do think that there is a line in the sense that there's always a line for anything. There's always a, a line that one shouldn't cross. That line is always negotiable or is negotiated and it changes a lot and it evolves over time and whatnot. And I'm not saying the line is a good thing, actually. I think the line is usually very conservative. Um, but that that's something that I'm partly curious to see where that line will be drawn because one thing that quote-unquote the elites to to use a buzzword here but like Qatari authorities FIFA authorities uh other authorities of other sporting nations whatever the people who make these decisions let's call them decision makers policy makers and whatnot I I think that and this is a generalization but I think it is generally true they're not very good at reading the room all the time they don't quite know always sometimes they do but often they don't quite know what the consequences will be. And for example, a very basic example, Qatar did not expect this kind of heat. It just didn't. No. And we, we know how badly prepared they were because the responses were more or less just bad and they were not very well prepared and they were taken by surprise often and, you know, all of these things. And in that, in that sort of arrogance in some sense, because they don't, they genuinely do not expect to be in the same way as, as I think you would remember uh, when MBS uh, assassinated Khashoggi, there were lots of reports that he was genuinely surprised that he would get a backlash. Like he was actually genuinely surprised mm. that there would be a backlash because, you know, he lived his entire life being able to do whatever he wants. And obviously all that power gives you that to some extent, to a large extent. And so I do think, as with anything, that a line will show. Like a line, in many ways, you can argue that had the previous World Cup not been in Russia, uh, maybe Qatar would have actually get, gotten away with more things. I don't know because Russia was used as a as a by people who were making that criticism as a, as a stepping stone in some sense. Like, well, we didn't do it enough last time, so we have to do it more now. Totally, you know, it yeah. becomes a what if of history in in that sense. But mm. it it is something like there is something to be said that we shouldn't. And I guess I'm saying this also from a kind of a point of optimism in some sense that we shouldn't, uh, like I'm saying there's a blueprint. Yeah, but blueprints can change and blueprints can mm. be challenged and blueprints can be a blueprint and actually fail. Like they may miscalculate just how much heat they may get and whatnot and actually end up regretting it, you know, and so on. I, actually, here's the thing. I love that you've said this. People need not to mistake the volume of a discourse for its depth. There's a lot of discourse happening at the end of this World Cup now about a particular piece of clothing that Messi was wearing traditional dress of an Arabian warrior. And I mentioned that in my essay, and I deliberately mentioned that at the top of the essay because I wanted people to understand who read the essay that I was operating for a place of good faith. Um, And that discourse is loud at the moment, but I don't think it's particularly deep. I think it evaporates. I think it's catharsis. What's interesting to me, and I saw a thread by someone going, oh, you know, Qatar's won, FIFA has won. I was like, 
Don't concede ground so easily. The legacy of this tournament is not entirely clear yet. We don't know how it's going to play out, right? Set Blatter lost his job a few years after everyone thought it was absolutely secure. What we saw P- at this World Cup... Previous president of FIFA, for those who don't know. Thank you, sorry, the previous president of FIFA. What we saw at this World Cup is a little like the effect of sunlight on an iceberg in 1973, right? Intense uh, intense sunlight on an iceberg in 1973, and that iceberg now is nowhere to be found because it's, dif- it's dissolved into the ocean water. And I think that is what's happened to a lot of Qatar's authority, FIFA's authority. I think Qatar made a big bet here. They wanted the World Cup for something. We don't know exactly what they want it for yet. And I'm not saying that to be a conspiracy theorist. I'm saying that because every time an authoritarian state spends that much money on something, they want it for something. They want the prestige for something in future, the same way Russia did, the same way Qatar did. My question is, what did Qatar want the World Cup for? What does Saudi want the World Cup for? Because they've got lots of money. They're doing very well for themselves. Are Qatar basically future-proofing themselves for a world where a lot of them can't live in Qatar, for a world where people don't care much about fossil fuels anymore. They're basically trying to future-proof themselves for future prestige. And I get that. I understand that. It's actually quite smart. You know, the lesson from this World Cup fundamentally should be, at some level, if you're a wealthy autocratic state relying on fossil fuels, get yourself a World Cup because you're going to need it later. And I suppose my point would be, for the defeatists going, it's all doom and gloom. No, it's really not, because you don't know, actually. You don't know that you've lost this. It feels like that in the short term, but the long-term effects, I think, are quite exciting for progressive voices. Sorry. Just can, I, can I add yeah, to go that? Um, yeah, I, I just I want to add that um, it's it's been quite interesting to see the enthusiasm and the vigor that a lot of our colleagues have worked on this World Cup in a way that they've not worked on past World Cups. Um, mm. And I think that, well, I don't expect that to necessarily continue, um, you know, we talked about giving a similar critical eye to the 2026 World Cup, which absolutely must happen. But I also think mm. we can start next week because guess what happens next week? We have the domestic leagues coming back. We can look into how sports washing works with, uh, within these domestic leagues, within ownerships. What are the problematic aspects within the Champions League? What are the problematic aspects um, with wealth disparity, with a number of issues that are happening. You know, we have the French Federation and all these um, sort of allegations that have happened within the Federation regarding sexual harassment and and otherwise. There's a lot Mm. of opportunities to do real hard-hitting journalism, activism, research in these settings today. We don't have to wait for four more years. And, um, you know, I I think as well, a lot of this will come down to... um, well, yeah, let me, let me maybe stop right there and just say that I think that we can continue with this energy and continue applying it. And I hope that many people don't just go back to um, saying, okay, well, now it's sport again, and now we can just kind of focus on the way it used to be. Because what, what Qatar didn't happen in a vacuum, you know, as, as, you, got, as, you, both have, as you all have mentioned, it, it is the end of a long process that allowed us to get here. So I think that if we can start applying this critical lens to everything, that's not to say call everything bloody murder, and, and make us desensitize to everything, but apply a hard, rigorous level of investigation, p- apply a hard, rigorous level of uh, w- trying to uphold and with, withhold, or, or excuse me, uphold uh, human rights. Um, there's, there's plenty of work to be done, and I hope that that's something that we will go forward and continue to do um, as, a, as a collective within, within media, activist, and research um, sectors. Can I just respond to that? Because yeah, I, I completely agree, and I think you know that that's what I've taken away from from this whole this whole you know observing the World Cup and how it's played out. And I guess I wish I had a better phrase, but we just have to go hard. I think is is the reality of it because, like, connected to what you were saying, Joey, about like the adoption of phrases of no discrimination still being bandied like around the World Cup, while there's very clear the World Cup's been built on racialized discrimination and also, you know, um, there is ongoing uh, discrimination in the hosting of the tournament against LGBTQ people. Um, my reflection on that is like, we're now, you're right, blueprints can change. And we, ha- I think what, going forward, we have to change the, the blueprint for how we engage with sport. Um, because like you mentioned, uh, MBS and yeah, one of the images that I took away from 2018 was 
the one that was like seared in my brain was Putin sitting next to Infantino and MBS, you know, as he just recently murdered a journalist. This time round, I remember what like being quite just kind of taking a moment to pause of seeing Noël Lecaille, um, who is the the president of the French Football Association, uh, next to Macron and and to me, Athani, the Emir of Qatar, and just thinking like our blueprint has to be different next time because we've been putting pressure on bad faith actors who do not actually um, in any way want to see human rights being mainstream more in sport. They're, they're antagonists. No, like you were talking about, we mentioned earlier the, the horrific racist abuse that French players are experiencing you know, as, as we speak. And I saw the like the Equipe de France, like their social media kind of tweeted in support of the players eventually and said they're going to kind of try to uh, bring complaints against the authors of kind of racist uh, messages on social media. And part of me was thinking, at the head of that institution, the FFF, he last year was on record saying that racism isn't really a big issue in football anymore when people were talking about racism in stands. Mm. He also uh, you know, had recently said that he, you know, it's, it's too strong to say there's homophobia in, in football. These are react, like our sport has been captured and reflects a lot of the kind of reactionary winds that are uh, driving a lot of uh, societal change at the moment, you know, whether uh, in, in many different societies. And so I think, you know, our blueprint for change, we have to treat these um, these decision makers, as you said, with deep cynicism, I think, mm. and constantly scrutinize and question them in the lead up to 2026. And as you said, as the, the as you said, Justin, as uh, domestic football resumes as well, and because there is a slight danger as well in that these decision makers have adopted the language of human rights mm. and they have instrumentalized it. And in this context, and I'm not saying this in a way to be defeatist, but like I think we have to kind of sit with the fact that this World Cup has got over the line in part mm. because when they were under significant international uh, media scrutiny, what they reverted to was doing a bit of human rightsy stuff. Like, and I'm using like um, air quotes basically because that's what happened. Like you, you mentioned, after you know, Seb Blatter had to step down and Infantino came uh, into power as the, the new president of FIFA, he was talking about human rights a lot in 2016. You know, he. He, when he was elected, he published this uh, kind of almost manifesto thing called Vision 2.0 FIFA, uh, within which there was a paragraph where they said FIFA will pursue its human rights responsibilities with the same rigor and intensity as its commercial um, ventures, which is a quite extraordinary thing. They were saying, you know, we're not going to put profit over human rights. That paragraph was never seen in like uh, printed FIFA material, but it was out there and it was reported on. Um, and in 2017, FIFA consulted human rights experts uh, on developing its own human rights policy, which on paper is in line with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, and this was a reverse of position for them because from when the World Cups, uh, the 2018 and 22, 22 World Cups were awarded in 2010, FIFA spent six years saying, no, we're a social institution. We don't have any responsibilities in, in relation to what's happening in Russia or in Qatar. I mentioned them earlier, BWI, the Builders and Woodworkers Internationals, had to bring a complaint at the OECD against FIFA before, uh, which they eventually settled, I think in 2016. And only at that point did FIFA basically say, okay, we're, we know we're a business. You know, they made, what, 7.5 billion, I think, out of this World Cup. And you know, then they, they implemented a human rights policy. But when it's actually mattered and what human rights organizations and activists were asking them to do in terms of use your leverage for sustainable systemic change, you haven't seen that implemented. And there's a danger now because they can point to their policy. They and they do a lot. They talk about their policy in many different forums. They come into civil society spaces and talk about this stuff. Um but when it actually matters, when you've seen uh, that that you know, obviously it hasn't actually um, been applied and Infantino actually has used the rhetoric which has been incredibly harmful to um, you know, the, univer the concept of universal human rights. So I think that you know, it's just incumbent on us to maintain that scrutiny, to treat these actors with deep cynicism because mm -hmm. they haven't demonstrated anything to us uh, you know, that they, which suggests they should be treated in any different way. 
And um, I just think we have to reclaim our sport, basically. If we love the sport, it's, it's on us to reclaim it from these uh, kind of reactionary elites. I want to throw this in there. What can we do to create a critical mass where pe- progressive voices in culture and civil society get together? You look like what Socrates did in the early 80s, right, with Corinthians and the music movement and all of that. I'm going to sound like Actually, an old Actually, um, talk about that a bit for those who don't know. Okay, so um, Socrates, incredible footballer, one of the great footballers of his generation, well, of all time, really. Uh, a leading figure in the 1982 Brazil World Cup team who played spectacular football, basically led a non-violent progressive movement against Brazil's military dictatorship in the early 1980s to the extent that they basically held a... He had the word democ- democracy printed on the shirt uh, that he wore when he led his Corinthians team to um, the national championship in Brazil. And the idea basically was to get a referendum on whether there should be democracy or not. So basically like the idea was basically to like turn Brazil from a, uh, an autocracy into a democracy. And that was the big thing that he ran on. And that he didn't achieve that in the time that he was playing. And so he said, look, if I if we don't get what we're aiming for, I'll go into exile, I'll go and play in Italy, which he did. But years later, I look at that and be like, well, Socrates actually won. Socrates won because he began a conversation whose momentum became irresistible. And I think at some level there needs to be, yeah, there is, I'm not saying that artists are not political, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that artists aren't political, I'm not saying that footballers are not political, but if you look at this World Cup and you see how footballers didn't take up something as um, mild as wearing a rainbow armband, what I look at that and think is actually at some level footballers are still isolated from wider progressive culture because if you're not isolated you feel braver in taking these steps the thing that was remarkable about socrates doing what he did in the 1980s is not that he did it is that so many footballers went along with him how do we lower the bar to progressive activism so that people feel comfortable on mastering it not just a few heroes because the whole thing about socrates was he wasn't saying this is about me it was about the collective and i think with the inequalities we're seeing now not just in football but in society the cost of living crisis on everyone's lips how is that feeling? Uh, how do we? How, what's the alchemy that takes that feeling, that sentiment about the injustice, into something really exciting? Because this is the thing. That, look, I love the work that a lot of anti-fascists are doing, and even those anti-fascists would say, "What steers us forward is not to be against something; it's a vision for the future." You know, Ryan and I joke on Stadi the whole time about a woke World Cup, like we're going to host a woke World Cup, and then we joke about what would a woke World Cup look like, and I'm like, "Well, renewable energy powering all stadiums." high speed rail wherever possible um you know subsidized tickets or free tickets for people from particular backgrounds like all of this stuff like what does the future look like what is the football that we're truly excited about look like what does woke football look like and we develop a vision of that over time and we very aggressively go hard after it you know sorry yeah, I, the lesson. <laughs> sorry I would just quickly say something. Uh, Fabien, I think at the very beginning you mentioned that football, like whether, regardless, almost like, not maybe entirely, but almost regardless of what's happening off the pitch, the games themselves can be very fun and engaging and, and even beautiful to watch. And I think that the final of the of the World Cup is a good example of that, The twenty, th- th- this one. Um, and so I think the the flip side of that is that that tells us that football doesn't have to be dirty. It doesn't have to be corrupt. It doesn't have to be. And I think the risk is of what's happening now. Mm. It's not even a risk. I think it's already happening. Is that they are, they, again, again, these authorities, policymakers and whatnot, are setting the boundaries of what is even acceptable to talk about and what is what we can even imagine to be the case. Uh, the example you mentioned of Socrates is one of the thousands of good arguments that we can make. And that, that was the title of the previous episode we did with Justin and Musa, that football is political. Um, I, I was doing some digging kind of out of curiosity in anticipating this, this conversation. And I, I have a thing for um, watching matches or reported like report, uh, reports about these matches of teams that no longer exist, like Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, you know, that sort of thing, West Germany, East Germany, that sort of thing. And there are interesting things. I'll just name a num- number of them. One, uh, when it comes to Yugoslavia, 
Yugoslavia, the Serbian and Montenegrin team were the ones that were able to claim the mantle of Yugoslavia in a way that Bosnia and Croatia were not able to. So at some point you had actually matches between Yugoslavia and Croatia, uh, Croatia being obviously ex-Yugoslavia. You also have the example of when East and, and West Germany, I think they had a single match in sometime in the 80s, late 80s, which was it is very interesting to watch the dynamics around that, the coverage of that. And the third example is in 1938, I think, World Cup. I had mentioned, I had sent it on the group with Justin and Musa between England and Germany, Germany being the Third Reich at the time, the English footballers did the Sieg Heil during the German national anthem. And a year later, World War II breaks up or something like that. And so that that's something that we need to remember, that today we would say like this was obviously a bad thing. Or, you know, I think even some people will try and be quote-unquote nuanced about it and say, that, well, they had to or whatever. But it's, it's <laughs> one of those things <laughs> so, of what... Sorry. <laughs> no, Sorry. it's okay. I mean, it is one of Just those things laugh. where um, it's just one of those things where w- we are able to apply more nuance to something that is seen as a historical fact. Like Nazis, bad historical fact. Or these days, again, some people are trying to be quote unquote more nuanced about things. But it is, it is, it is something to to look out for, right? And I mean, Justin, you wanted to add something, but I wanted to kind of steer us in a different direction. But go for it first. What I wanted to do is, is I think we can pose a really interesting question because this World Cup was meaningful for a lot of people in certain ways. And I think a lot of people tried to address this and did so, in my opinion, a bit clumsily um, in terms of how do you, de- you know, talking about the woke World Cup, for example, Musa, I think another question maybe we can ask is like, how do we decenter Europe without doing harm, right? Like, so mm. how can we have a meaningful World Cup for the Arab, for the Muslim, for the uh, Middle Eastern, for the Asian, for the for people outside of the center of empire or mm. or traditional empire, without you know leading to so many direct deaths. Mm. Um, and I think you know, uh, I think Musa, you asked the question: is is how can we build a critical mass? I mean, I've I can't tell you how many people have cited Stadio to me as one of these spaces that has enlarged their imagination and enlarged their thinking because I think. The current space exists in such, you know, Joe, you said people are controlling the the, the discourse. They're controlling what, what we're able to think or they're trying to set the agenda anyways. And Musa, what you and Ryan do on a weekly basis is expand that agenda and expand our imagination. And, you know, I'll tell you guys something a bit personal. Before this tournament started, I'm, I've just had a very brutal year personally. And I really just wanted to stay away from the discourse and just maybe take a month off and do all these things. And I, and I kind of looked around and I said, listen, as um, somebody who has the experience that I've had regionally, who, who, who knows football relatively the way that I do, or has covered it a little bit, I felt I had a responsibility to at least lend my voice at times to this argument, not to center myself or make myself any form of important. It's just that I felt I had kind of fit in the Venn diagram of something that might be useful at times. And I had at least one person come to me and say, hey, I appreciated your work during this month, or I appreciated, um, for example, some of your tweets or, or one of your pieces, because if I didn't read what you had said and known that you're coming from a place of good faith, I probably would have been like, yeah, you know, who are we to criticize or who am I to, who am I to think about these things in this way or all these other sort of things? And I think that just goes to say that every individual voice, and I can't tell you how much you know, being in a group chat with Joey and Musa has been so influential and chatting with Fab about all these things over the past two, three years in terms of labor rights, in terms of um, pretty much every sort of angle and issue that's come in uh, towards the discourse uh, leading up to and throughout the month in Qatar. So without you guys, I wouldn't be here. And without Stadio, I wouldn't be here having the energy and the confidence to speak what I'm speaking. And so in that sense, I think we need to keep organizing. Of course, now the question is, how do we amplify that, right? Because mm. recently, you know, there there is no real Socrates with the Brazilians right now. The best we have is maybe Richarlison, who yeah. is the lone voice who kind of spoke out for Lula, whereas the rest kind of went in the other direction, probably for very self-serving purposes related to tax or or potential lawsuits or whatever else may may come of that. Or just dinner parties. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, and and I mean, this is the thing today is that footballers are less and less coming from a place of um, or at least top level e- elite footballers are coming less and less from these sort of places where they can connect with the common people. And, you know, their lives are so sheltered from teenage onward that this is their reality. 
So the question is, how can we reach a critical mass where somebody feels the pressure, you know, where an Mbappe feels the pressure where if they don't speak out, mm. there might be some sort of financial, economic, uh, social sort of pressure there. And I think these are the things that, that maybe are challenging today. But I think we do need to start from the grassroots up with, you know, more kind of community engagement, with more sort of connections across um, well, what I think is really interesting right now is we have a couple, you know, we have Fab, who's a researcher, Joey, you know, you're a writer and an activist and an academic, and Moose and myself who are, are maybe more in the, the journalistic side of things. And coalescing and bringing our different perspectives is huge. And I think we need to continue to grow these sort of spaces going forward if we want to have any sort of critical mass um, that will sh at least shift the conversation, if not, if not lead it. Yeah, I'm like incredibly hyped by what you were all just saying because that's that's kind of that's exactly what I feel and what I want to hear. Like I think organizing is just the the that has to be the word going forward. And you know, returning to that idea of the blueprint, we do have it. Like in the sense of if you look at, for example, Bayern Munich's ultras, you know, have been really consistent about talking about the connections between uh, you know the commercial connections and and the kind of PR connections between Bayern Munich's you know, a dominance of the Bundesliga over the past few decades, past decade or so, and their connection with um, the the Qatari Sports uh, project in the World Cup specifically. And, you know, they've been campaigning, they've been very visible. They've also built solidarity and connections with migrant workers and uh, trade unions uh, from Nepal, for example. They've hosted migrant workers to come and talk in their football spaces about what is actually... Um, you know, what their, their their team's involvement actually means in the lives of migrant workers. Um, here in France, you know, Les Ijabeurs are so inspiring. You know, young, uh, predominantly Muslim uh, black women um, who wear the hijab, or sometimes choose to wear the hijab uh, in different contexts and who are campaigning against a discriminatory law, which the French Football of, uh, Federation is denying the right to be able to play football. They're making them have to choose between their religion, their cultural identities, and the right to participate in the sport they love. It's a discriminatory law. It's clearly against um, uh, against uh, footballs like purport to be uh, you know a space for everyone to be involved. And you know they're campaigning. Uh, that and I saw recently you know they came to the UK and played against another women's team. Mm. Um, and you know that's to me that's there is the blueprint. And I think. Like what you were just saying, Justin, um, is where I come um, come at this from. Is that I don't think that we've tapped into the radicality of football. Mm. There's nothing as, and that's one thing that I think I've been thinking about a lot during this this World Cup. We always hear FIFA, and we've heard the Qatari uh, World Cup World Cup organizers constantly say sports brings people together. But in what? But they mean it in a very different way than we do. They mean it to get their project, uh, you know, across the line, sort of thing. And they know that, yeah, when when the, the whistle blows, everyone's focused on the football and that is in and of itself unifying. But there is nothing universally which brings people's focus and energy and connection together. And there's, I think, huge untapped solidarity there. And I think, you know, actually that that invigorates me, that, that gets me hyped, like I said, because, and we've seen it as well in other areas, you know, when it came to talking about domestic football, um, uh, when it came to the Super League, uh, you know, it was so clearly in such an illegitimate um, way of approaching this issue. People, you know, fans just said, like, fuck this, basically, you know, fans were out on the streets. And it's like, how do we tap into that? kind of? You know, that was, there was direct action happening. And, you know, we, our responsibility as journalists, activists, researchers, academics, is to better connect with that and kind of, like you said, amplify and help foster that. Because I think relying on autocrats and technocrats in FIFA and the FAs isn't going to get us anywhere because like we said with the English FA you know, he had Greg Hans who's like he was the head of the FA during uh, you know a lot of this period and we're asking him to go and talk uh, to the Qatari authorities about human rights when he's like, got a long history of using racist language um, in the UK football context so and I've just one final thing as well is like a lot of these the reason why I, I mean about tapping into the radicality of football is there is an element where football is incredibly meritocratic, and that's why we see, um, you know, black football is excelling uh, across, uh, you know, where in other elements of society they face like systemic prejudice and discrimination, 
but you know, when it comes to just uh, where uh, on the football pitch where you can if your your talent plays out and the, the, there's such investment in winning that pe- people's talent kind of forces their way through all the barriers that they still experience and pe- you, you know you've heard Mbappe talking about you know uh, growing up in Bundi um, and also the one thing that kept coming to my mind watching Morocco was, I think it was Hakimi was the first player to wear the Justice for George Floyd t-shirt when he was playing for Dortmund, him and Jaden Sancho. And I've I've read him talking about, you know, remembering where he's from and his mother's struggles being, you know, a, a second generation, uh, you know, the son of immigrants. Um, and a lot of our stars and, and heroes, they do come from that background. You know, we talked about Marcus Rashford earlier. He's talked about his experience of poverty, of racial discrimination as a young kid and how that's formed him. And I think there's a lot of snobbishness when we talk about footballers. And actually we, and, and I think that comes from a lot of the sports, the kind of traditional sports media. And I think that to tap into that radicality, we need to build a connection with the communities where a lot of the best footballers in the world come from. And I think you're right. They do, you know, increasingly live kind of shelters ex- existence once they get kind of signed up at a young age. But you know, their their communities, their friends, their families are still, you know, experiencing inequalities or live with inequalities. And I don't have the answer, but I think we, by organising and just uh, focusing on solidarities, I think we can uh, tap into that radicality. I'm really excited by this, Fabian. Can I just say, um, amazing, amazing segment there that really just got my brain firing in so many ways the as you were speaking i had to drop this stat i know i put my hand up in the chat but i had to bring this stat before i forgot Derek ray tweeted the statistic about the world cup in germany to your point about the buy and ultras having this incredible impact the activism the effect of their activism i think cumulatively the act the ultras in in germany done an incredible job the progressive ultras for those who don't know ultras are basically uh they're often stigmatized as football fans who are just violent it's really not that they're football not footballers football fans of various political stripes, sometimes progressive, sometimes reactionary, who organize social projects beyond the boundaries of the football stadium. So they organize food drives, um, protests. And in, in the case of the Bayern Ultras, Bayern is, you know, in many ways, it seems quite a conservative club, but the Ultras have done some really exciting progressive work. Here is some idea of their concrete impact. Derek Ray, commentator on German football, here's a quote today on Twitter. The 2022 World Cup was seen more critically and negatively than in most other frontline football countries and viewing figures reflected that throughout. The final on ZDF, the leading German uh, TV station, attracted 13.86 million viewers, down significantly from 21.45 million for the 2018 final. That is, you know, a huge percentage of that can be taken, like a huge amount of credit can be taken by progressive slash radical activists. Friends of mine who boycotted the entire tournament had a huge effect on me and how I cover the tournament because it always reminded me that actually, are we complicit by consuming this? And when you talk about the places these people came from, I'm thinking about being on the ground next time, if not next year, then hopefully in future, at let's say um, the World Cup they hold in Paris for the different regions, you know, the people from different nationalities that go and play like, but not just going to the final, but going to early rounds of those games and just being present. Even if it's like one of 50 spectators at a game in the early rounds, I want to do that in the next couple of years, stuff like that, just being on the ground for it because this World Cup has really excited me because the individual friends of mine that boycotted had an impact on me that's exponential because I have bigger platforms, right? So if someone boycotts and goes, I'm not watching the World Cup or speaking to you about it, that means when I give an interview on a media platform, that person's in my head and I'm broadcasting their message to a much bigger audience. So I suppose what I really mean by that is to sort of round up quite a rambling point is it's being on the ground, it's being present in the quote unquote unglamorous, more boring places before the full glare of the World Cup is on us again in four years, what is the quote unquote unglamorous work we can do to build momentum that by the time 2026 comes around, there's more than one Richarlison and there may even be a Socrates. And it speaks to your point before as well, Musa, doesn't it, that we still don't know what the consequences of this World Cup are yet, which is it's too soon to, to kind of make that assessment. Um, I think 
there's there's a number of things there, um, and so my thoughts would be a bit disconnected. There's there's been a number of comparisons between, uh, for example, Maradona and Messi, right? Like the, the obvious comparison, they knew each other uh, in many ways. Messi uh, or Maradona saw himself as like Messi's, uh, you know, football father or whatever, you know. But I think there's a there's an argument to be made about how much football has changed since Maradona compared to Maradona, you know, from Maradona's time to Messi's time. And this isn't to say that oh, the solution is to just go back. For one, that's impossible, and for two, like there were there were always issues even back then I, mean, I just mentioned that in 1938 the English uh, team did the Sikh Heil you know so there's always been significant problems related to football because that's just how power works that's how money works that's just that's just a thing of, of that's just reality in many ways I'm talking especially like quote unquote high level football where a lot of money usually is exchanged and spent so that's one thing and the kind of link to that is regardless of Messi's personal attributes as a footballer and I'm just using him as an example because everyone knows him but there is something to be said of how much a day many of these footballers, especially if they get to a certain level of popularity and sort of fame, they almost like stop being human. Like they stop being real people who make decisions and who are, you know, should be held accountable, you know, and as anyone else. And this is obviously a byproduct in many ways of just the money, the increased money spent compared to before. So that that's another thing. We mentioned Morocco. I want us to kind of zoom in on that a bit if that's okay. Because Morocco is a very, very interesting example of kind of one of the miracles, to use a term that many people used, uh, around something like a World Cup that regardless, again, to Fabian's point before, that regardless of how the the politics of the game around it, the game itself can still be very interesting for different reasons. And that's just a result of just how complexity works. Like The definition of it is that we don't quite know always what the consequences will be, even if we're skeptical or even opposing, let's say, where how it started, in this case, the Qatar World Cup. Morocco is very interesting because the team, the players themselves, were, for example, waving the Palestinian flag. And that's very, very significant for a number of reasons. And I'm just going to mention one of them is that the Moroccan government itself has actually normalized ties with the Israeli one. It has always been on the Israeli side, even back to the like the late 40s and early 50s. It's, it's kind of an outlier, even within, quote-unquote, the Arab world in that sense, or at least the one that was the most explicit. So this was political, and the Moroccan team, a number of them, I think majority of them, are diasporas. And so they, they are able to sort of, I don't know if get away necessarily, but they have a certain flexibility that, may, that other players maybe may not have. The other thing, obviously, is that through that display of support towards Palestine, one should and did, and I was among them, many did, point out that uh, Morocco itself is an occupying power in Western Sahara. Mm. And so those two things exist at the same time. You had the people who were uh, saying, for example, like it's a very good thing that they're waving the Palestinian flag and they would point out that all of the people, usually racists and Islamophobes, were very bothered by that as and so that's one thing. But then there are many folks who stopped at that and who didn't take it what I would argue to be kind of the next level in some sense, or at least more honest or whatever, more progressive, let's put it that way, of pointing out that, yeah, it's a good thing that they did that, but it is not a whataboutism to mention what about Western Sahara for the same reasons that I just mentioned. Now, it doesn't mean that every single one of them maybe could do it. It doesn't mean that. But it, it should mean that there has to be some conversation around that rather than that conversation being kind of shut down. Now, I don't want us to focus too much just on that example because uh, we, we don't have too much time. But I just wanted to mention it as an example of how a, a team, like it's just an, a regular a, a football team, like 11, he was talking about men's football, 11 men playing football, kicking a ball around for like 90 plus minutes can have this huge symbolic weight. Uh, sometimes even preceding them, like just the f just the fact that they are associated with a country, with a flag, with whatever a culture, or we're well, not a culture, but like you know, with Morocco, with North Africa, with the Muslim world, with the Arab world, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, can have all of those other resonances that precedes the team even starting to play football. And then obviously, the more they played, and when they won against Belgium, and then Portugal, and then Spain, and whatnot, this created all of those other connections that I think can still be built on. Yeah. Um... I think this is such a, a great um, transition. I think the Morocco's, I mean, Morocco was clearly the, the I mean, apart from maybe the whole Messi narrative that may in, in one way kind of take, take hold and capture. Um, I think Morocco was, was one of, if not the story of the tournament. Um, they were the, you know, the people's team, if you will. That being said, you brought up the very 
like uncomfortable point for for some people, which was that while people were out waving a Moroccan flag, there is a group of of oppressed and occupied people with that fall under the control of that flag. Um, and there was even footage of the team seen singing songs about Western Sahara on the team bus. Um, I think, you know, we we can look at the Palestine issue and there's overlap with that into Morocco, particularly because a lot of different teams were waving the Palestine flag and it appeared a lot. We even saw, um, you know, members of the Qatari royal family wearing Palestine armbands that were supposed to be, again, this east-west divide that sort of was like, you support gay rights, we support Palestine, as if those two things cannot both be supported or can be, you know, intersectional and unanimous. Um, so, or su- rather supportive of each other, I guess I should say. Um, I think, you know, looking at it from, I guess, a certain perspective, the Morocco story was was great. You know, it got a lot of the, the I guess we can call it like the global south on board. There was definitely like kind of a, a pan-Arabist or a pan-Arab uh, support of Morocco as well, and maybe not in the traditional political sense, but in a way that, you know, like personally, I've never been to Morocco, um, but I remember kind of even like ju- kind of jumping on the bandwagon, if you will, and 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 share and trying to share in that joy with other Arabs that I know or with my Moroccan friends. And there were really beautiful moments. And I remember I was out at like a, a, a party that was traditionally playing like Lebanese and, and Egyptian dance music. And there was a group at the front um, who I guess I had just kind of assumed were, were, were probably Lebanese as, as a lot of the people attending were. And when uh, the DJ played uh, Disco Maghreb, which was like the hit of the summer by DJ Snake, um, they just kind of took the atmosphere to another level and pulled out flags and football jerseys from like their local team, not even the national team kit. And we started to chat and we exchanged kind of like some niceties in, in French, obviously, because the Arabic dialects were were not working out um, as they're they're very different and we're obviously on opposite sides of, of, of I guess, what you could call the MENA region. Um, and I remember one guy kind of saying to me, like, you know, we did, he, he, the way he expressed it was there wasn't like a huge local music culture where in his small town where he was growing up. And so they would watch Lebanese Star Academy on TV. And this was why they knew all the hits and all the songs. And so there was that nice moment of connection. And I think through this, um, you know, this was, a, this was a very rudimentary and basic exchange where we just kind of talked about, you know, the shared kind of culture and, and niceties and, and exchanged uh well, I gave him congratulations over their performance in the World Cup. But there were also a lot of deeper conversations that I had with other, um, you know, Arabs or people based and in or from the the wider Arab region and diaspora, where we talked about uh, Arab identity and pan-Arab identity and what that could be versus what it was during, you know, maybe under Nasser or in other periods. Um, and, it, and it was really inspiring and it was really great to see. Of course, throughout all that, we have to also grapple with... Um, you know, the actual symbolism of how the Palestinian flag was used throughout the World Cup, which in a lot of ways was a very positive and, and present thing and beautiful thing. But I think also in some ways we have to ask, well, while all actions are somewhat performative and performative doesn't mean that it's not a positive thing, I think there's also a question of, you know, at what times was it maybe used as a deflection for certain things? As well as I, w- I just want to add one last point, and I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm rambling a bit, but... I think there, you know, there is a there is a solid history of of solidarity between Palestinian and Western Saharan or Sahrawi um, activists and opposition leaders, and I think that would be a really interesting doorway to step through as we go forward as as we seek liberation for for all people living under occupation. Yeah, I, I think um, it was a really profound reflection, and it, just that word that keeps coming up in our discussions is just the the pathway that Justin was saying to walk through is, is solidarity. Like two of the images that I will take forward from, um, as well as the, you know, the Palestine solidarities, um, when Morocco beat, I think when they beat Spain, I don't know if you all saw this video, they went kind of viral on kind of French Twitter of what I presume is a, 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 an older white French guy in the north of France. I'm not sure if it was Lille maybe. Um, and, you know, from my interpretation of what I was uh, viewing was uh, Moroccan fans driving around celebrating. And he's there, and I found it incredibly moving. And he's got the Moroccan flag and he's kissing it. And he says, c'est pour les mineurs, c'est pour les mineurs. 
and he's talking about um, Moroccan migrant workers who were brought to France, to the north of France, sent down into coal mines, incredibly dangerous situations, exploited. And, and he says, c'est pour l'exit, c'est pour eux, les gars. Um, and I, I, to me, I was like, that's the solidarity, that's the connection. There's a difference when, um, you know, when state officials are bandishing flags, etc. They're like I said, I think we need to maintain a level of cynicism about how decision makers, policy makers, and people profiting from these events instrumentalize symbolism. But when it's people in the street, you know, expressing their joy, identifying connections between struggles, I think we have to really like lean into that. We have to celebrate that. Um, and the the thing, the other last kind of image that I take away as well is just from. Um, uh, the, the the final took place on the 18th of December, right? Um, which was Qatari National Day, but it was also International Migrants Day as well. And there was a big sans-papier, um, kind of undocumented people's march in Paris about exploitation of undocumented people. I, you know, and, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, that's a movement I'm very connected with. I have family members who, direct family members who were sans-papier in France, like um, in generations previous to me. And what I found incredibly amazing is that people were mobilizing for their rights here in Paris, talking about being exploited by big companies, state-run companies who know that they are, don't have status and still are you know, uh, uh, taking their labor and exploiting the precarity of their situation. A very similar, different, but there are connections with the treatment of migrant workers in Qatar. And they had a minute's silence. They had banners about migrant workers in Qatar to those who died building the stadiums and all the other infrastructure. And again, to me, that just pointed the way forward for us in terms of talking about 2026. And, you know, there will definitely be an issue to do with like, undocumented labour in, in some of the cities uh, where the, the, the World Cup is going to be happening in Qatar. And we just have to build those, those, uh, those connections because people are already doing it. People who are mobilising for their rights see the, the connections in, in, in our struggles. And I think we just have to make sure that the narrative and the discourse that accompanies these uh, these events, these mega sporting events, reflects what people on the ground are actually saying and doing, because actually we've had too much discourse from people who are profiting and who uh, are implicated rather than subjected to the situation. So they're the two images kind of building on the amazing stuff that uh, Justin was saying as well that, that I'll take away from, uh, from the past month. Musa, did you want to say something? No, I'm just, I was just, I'm excited. I'm excited because every, everything I've heard in the last 10, 15 minutes has given me a bit of a roadmap in terms of me thinking, I'm going to organize my time to get to different places, towns, areas where people have done this work, where the resistance really worked. Like those viewing figures dropping to the World Cup final, that's huge. Like that's huge. And I, not to, just to mention or reference something I mentioned um, a few weeks ago, I said the World Cup had already failed because FIFA basically is able to cast this spell over so many of us where whatever happens, we'll all watch the final. But we didn't all watch the final. And we didn't, even those who watched the final didn't engage with the final as uncritically as we had done with previous World Cups. That is a huge, huge benefit. I think Germany learned a lot from its endorsement of Russia and what Russia is now doing to Ukraine. I think that can be... I think it's, it's interesting to see how that, that political activism plays out. But the reason I didn't say anything is because I was just stopping and thinking, wow, this gives me a roadmap of what I need to do. Like in an exciting way, not in a kind of, oh my God, like that one, uh, a cat I want. They didn't actually. I don't think they did. The more I talk to you, the more I hear from you, I'm thinking there's so much we can do that's exciting. So sorry to ramble, but just like, that's why I was quiet because I was just sitting, wow, this, I can see how this works. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I also message you guys probably each individually or as a collective at times differently at different times throughout the tournament saying, I really feel defeated in this moment because the discourse is just going in such the other direction. Um, but again, you know, gathering and talking with the with the four of us here, it's been yeah, it's been incredibly inspiring. And I and I think I'm going forward with a lot of of renewed energy. So on on that note, uh, because we're close to the two hours mark, let's let's do it this way if that's okay with you. I, I've asked you to kind of prepare. Usually, what I do with all guests is I ask them to recommend three books on any topic. In this case, since there's like uh, three of you, you know, we can do one book each to kind of cut on time as well. But what? Let's start with the book recommendations and just individually, and then we can finish with like um, kind of final reflections and you know that sort of thing. I can go. Um, 
first, I think everyone should read all of Musa's books. They should read <laughs> all of his articles. <laughs> oh, they should read all of Joey's work and and look out for everything that that Fab's done over the, the past decade or and more as well. Um, the book I want to suggest particularly is one called Soccer Empire by Laurent Dubois, and it kind of outlines. Um, it's it's a bit of an academic book, but incredibly well written and easy to read and easy to get through. Um, but outlines um, kind of the history of the French national team from, if I'm not mistaken, 1998 to about 2010. So it's a, it's some of the information in there is a bit dated now, but it's it's still just such an enlightening book that goes into great detail, particularly focusing on Lilian Tucham, who um, is a, essentially now gone from being a, a, a historic footballer to a public intellectual with anti-racism uh, institutes and um, somebody who's widely kind of criticized within France, though widely respected also within France and outside for his work that some see as divisive, though um, I find incredibly powerful. And his son was actually on the the French team this time around. Um, uh, Marcus, as, right? as, is that his name? Marcus Turam. Yeah, that's right. And it also focuses on uh, kind of the divergent character of Zinedine Zidane, who um, has taken, you know, what many might call like the Michael Jordan approach to to um, sports and activism and that he kind of is highly uh, protective of his image and doesn't speak out on politics rarely, if ever, though he has publicly come out, I think, once in 2002 to to kind of say that people should not vote for the far-right candidate Jean-Marie Le Pen. Um, of course, more recently, he's taken a, a we can call it a quote-unquote, air quotes, um, non-political approach by saying that people should focus on football in Qatar, and that was quite disappointing. Um, but yeah, it's a wonderful read, and I su- I suggest it for just a way to kind of ex- extend your thinking on on football, um, empire, legacies of racism and colonialism. It's just a wonderful read. Um, I would like to uh, throw compliments back Justin's way. You should write more because his work is amazing. And actually, let me throw a challenge out to everyone in this podcast. The Last of Us, to publish something, um next year uh be it a book or an article has to buy everyone else dinner <laughs> i'm just throwing that out there <laughs> sounds good uh in in paris in paris okay it's got to happen it's got to be in paris so yeah dinner for all of us in paris for the last person to to publish something next year hopefully that won't be you justin because your work's amazing and i think um if there's any criticism i've got of you it's that you don't produce enough uh because your voice really matters um you're an amazing writer, and I think sometimes you <laughs> got it sent to therapy session. I think you, I think, I think you don't fully understand the power of your work and the nuance of your work. So we need more of you. Um, the book I'd recommend is either Joey's next book, or Justin's <laughs> next book, or Fabna's next book. But the current book to recommend is "The Ball Is Round" by David Goldblatt, an extraordinary writer. That is a book about the culture of football. It's very long and it's very accessible. His work is absolutely essential. Um, He's a historian of football, a lover of the game, politics and football intertwined. And he's going to be a really, really important voice in the lead up to the World Cup in the US and Mexico and Canada. For, yeah, I just want to take a moment just to really salute you all for all the work, the advocacy, because you have been doing advocacy during the tournament. I think having, you know, working on doing research and stuff and engaging with authorities over the past few years, it's been really uh, gratifying and and re- a real relief to see you all using your platforms to to advocate for um, for change for human rights and for um, progressive causes. Like I don't, you really shouldn't underestimate how important that is because over the years I've seen public figure after public figure, whether it be a politician, a politician, a sports person, go the other way. Um, and so it's actually really important what you've been doing. So really, um, I respect everything that you've done. Um, and I, I'm excited to take it forward as well as, as this discussion, um, uh, suggested, I think in terms of a book, I'm going to recommend a book that I often recommend to people. I think I even gave it to you, Justin, uh, the turbulence of migration by Dr. Nikos Papastakiadis. I I recommended it to somebody last night, actually. Oh, great. It was a book that, you know, had a big influence on me. And especially like when we were talking about the the, the, the weaponization of the concept, it's like singular concept of culture. Uh, it really kind of takes that apart and explains, you know, looks at how culture is a process and can be, um, can, 
it, it just doesn't at all fit with the, the way that James John Barnes and others were describing it, and also just on the the effects expected, unexpected, uh, foreseeable, unforeseeable of migration and how migration and hybridity are you know, just so fundamental to the human experience. Uh, so I definitely recommend that book. And there's a slight like connection to sport there in that I was reading his work while I was um, you know, studying uh, for an MA around migration and law. And then I was just kind of, I was so affected by this book. I was looking for other things he'd written. And then I just saw an article written by him in a very uh, a journal I'd never heard of before, which had the name Cantona, which obviously just like made my heart beat <laughs> because, you know, I'm a United fan. Cantona was uh, my hero growing up. And I was like, why is this migration scholar writing about Cantona? So I ended up like contacting him and he basically did a fellowship in Manchester in the kind of mid nineties. And he, I don't think he was particularly a football fan at that point, but he was just like, he was uh, fascinated by the figure of Cantona, what he represents, as we were talking about Joe Rieta, just of, um, who he was as a foreigner in England, who was taught about art and poetry and was a radical uh, in, in a moment of football, really not being uh, kind of connected with those those ideas. And he took on anti-fascists and things. And so he decided to write an article about what Cantona meant to him and to football. And then as he, it so happened that as his fellowship was ending, he was having his, I think, his leaving drinks in a bar in Manchester, and who walks in? Eric Cantona. So he actually got to meet him, <laughs> and uh, so we we've always, we've maintained the dialogue uh, since having that discussion. And uh, we, um, he, he's just a great academic, does amazing work, and uh, I'd recommend uh, yeah, that book uh, highly. Amazing. Well, I mean, uh, on that pretty fun note, <laughs> uh, <laughs> unless anyone has like final reflections, because we're close to the two hours mark. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for this amazing conversation. We ended up s s talking more than we had originally planned, but this often happens on this podcast. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to release it like pretty soon, maybe today or tomorrow. Uh, so folks will be able to, to listen to it fresh and hopefully have like uh, critical and interesting thoughts to take uh, into the holidays with them. Uh, so thank you all for doing this. Thank, thank you. you. It's been a, pl a real pleasure to exchange with you all. The Fire These Times is hosted by myself, Joey Ayou. I am also its producer, researcher, writer, and sound editor. If you want to help turn this project into a full-time job, please head out to patreon.com slash times to support it. These episodes are part of a bigger project which includes resources, a newsletter, and eventually YouTube video essays as well. As always, thank you for listening and take care.